And I will go and mute myself right now and passing things over to Lynn Robinson to get us started. Thank you all. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lynn Robinson, and I'm the Media Relations Manager for the Department of Municipal Affairs, uh, Municipal and Provincial Affairs. Thank you for joining us this morning for a virtual conversation on the 2021 municipal elections. Our live broadcast is now open, and I'll turn the event over to Crystal Lynn Howell, Minister of Municipal Affairs, uh, Municipal and Provincial Affairs. Thanks, Lynn. Good morning, everyone. I'm so glad that you could join us this morning for our conversation on municipal governance and about the upcoming municipal elections on September the 28th. So a lot of preparations have been underway over the past several months in the Department of Municipal and Provincial Affairs, as well as at municipalities, Newfoundland and Labrador, and I'm sure in all the individual communities as they get ready for what's about to happen and, and how things are about to transition in their communities. So through the Make Your Mark campaign, we've been working to raise awareness around the importance of engagement and diversity, accessibility and inclusion in municipal governance. And these conversations are focusing on the need for diverse voices on councils so that we have a reflection of the growing diversity of Uh, Pam Parsons, the Minister Responsible for Women and Gender Equality. I also have Amy Cody Davis, who's the President of Municipalities Newfoundland and Labrador, also a Councillor in Grand Falls, Windsor. Uh, Laura Bell Imba, a social activist who's been contributing her thoughts on diversity at the local government level. And Tom Rose, who is the Indigenous Mayor of Stephenville. So thank you so much and welcome to each of you. So glad to have you on the conversation this morning. And the goal of, of what we're up to here is to encourage as many people as possible to put their names forward for the election. So with that in mind, I think we'll start the conversation off um, with given our pitch or each of us uh, sharing a little bit about why we think participation in municipal politics is so important. And uh, I'll start us off. My experience is such that um, I was a, a young nurse working in a rural Newfoundland community and I love to swim, but I was concerned about the state of the swimming pool in my community and was worried that uh, other people around the council table in the town didn't really understand the importance of it. So with a little bit of a bee in my bonnet, I ran in a by-election in uh, 2015 and uh, I was successful in, in getting a seat at the council table. And from there, I, I learned a lot about what was happening in council chambers and realized that the council really did have an understanding of the swimming pool. So while I came in feeling like I was the only one carrying that, that flame, um, I realized that they really did have a course of action and a plan. And I was able to contribute my voice and my perspective as a swimmer to that conversation. So um, that was very encouraging to know that the people around the table who were making the decisions actually did have a, a grip on the reality of, of the town. Uh, like I said, I was, I was young and fresh and uh, showed up to the first council meeting with my high heel shoes and my shiny jewelry. And uh, a bunch of uh, seasoned gentlemen were sitting around the table. Most of them had spent almost as many years in politics, municipal politics, as I had lived in the community. So um, they were very welcoming, very accepting, and uh, they allowed me to voice my perspectives and to have my say. They listened to me and asked my opinions, and they treated me with respect and always as an equal. So uh, I can truly say that my experience with Municipal Council has been a positive one. Over the course of time there, there were several challenges in the community, several things that came up that um, I felt like I had a, a unique perspective on or I had something different to offer to the conversations that occurred in our community being a, a young working professional. And uh, I was able to impact the things that happened in the town of St. Anthony. And um, I give credit to a, a strong team who worked together very well and moved forward very progressively in our community to make things happen. And um, 
I, I was pleased to know that somebody like me who who didn't have a whole lot of experience at the time or even much of an understanding, I, I knew where the council building was and that was about it at that time. Um, but uh, I was able to make a difference, to have a voice and to influence change in my community for things that mattered. So um, I, I think the most rewarding thing for me and all of that was knowing that my viewpoint and my ideas mattered and somebody validated that by allowing me to be part of those conversations. So we'll, uh, we'll move through the, the rest of the participants and see if there's uh, anything that anybody wants to, to make their pitch. Um, we're inviting P um, Minister Parsons. Have you got anything that you'd like to add there this morning about uh, the roles of, from your perspective in your department? Absolutely. And uh, and you and I, I guess we, we, we both were elected to office in 2015. Uh, as you know, I was elected provincially. I became the provincial, the, of course, the, the provincial member of the MHA for the District of Harbour Grace, Port of Grave. Um, that's, of course, where I grew up, actually, in the community of Spaniards Bay, and I currently live now in Bay Roberts. Uh, but uh, for me, in my experience, I, I was a young child. I remember I was actually attending school at the, uh, the old St. Columbus School in, in Harbour Grace. I was 10 in grade 5 when a close friend of a family uh, ran for politics. Um, it was, it was my, my, it was a man, um, but I just felt so inspired, you know, and I was the, all the excitement about the community talking and rallying. My parents were involved. Uh, they're, they were normally not political people and they still aren't today. Um, but this was a family friend who they rallied around to support. So I got to see, you know, some of that activity firsthand. And I just remember feeling the excitement. And I, and I always thought like, you know, this is something that I'd like to do when I grow up. And I kept it with me throughout the years. Um, of course, I went through my schooling. I graduated high school at Ascension Collegiate in Bay Roberts. I went on to Mount St. Vincent University in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and then on to Kings Tech in the Annapolis Valley, where I did journalism, uh, broadcast journalism, of course. And so I pursued my journalism career, which I loved. And I still love to this day. I, I, great memories. And I really think helped prepare me to, to make my move into politics. Um, it was always a long-term goal of mine, but uh, I had that fire and I kept it with me. I was actually approached to run sooner than I did uh, for, for a party that I, that, I, that I didn't join, actually, as you know, we're, we're, we're you know, a liberal MHA. But, uh, I, you know, I took the plunge, I guess, when the timing, um, it's never right. If we're, I, in my opinion, if we're waiting for the right time to join politics, I guess we'll be waiting forever. So right. you've, got to, you've got to take risks. Oh. You've got to jump in there. And, uh, you know, I went for it. And, um, you know, elected for my third time. Uh, but that said, I just want to, you know, there's 40 seats in the House of Assembly in particular. There are only nine represented by women um, and even less on some on some councils. Actually, there is a council in my district currently that has no female representation at all. So I'm really happy to be part of this conversation today. And I commend the minister, my friend, of course, Krista, uh, you know, to, to bring this together and to talk about the importance of getting more diversity around those tables. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll turn it over to uh, Miss Amy Cody Davis, and you can make your pitch to to get people to to join the the run yeah, for municipal thank politics. Thank you, Minister. Um, I was uh, initially elected in a general election in two thousand and nine, but I had previously run in two back to back by elections a year prior, um, and obviously was unsuccessful in my bid in those by elections. But um, got such a taste for uh, politics. You know, when that general election came around, I was just, I'm doing it this time. I am getting there um, and was successful. And and even looking back at the, the two by-elections, even though I wasn't elected, elected in those by-elections, um, you know, I look at that experience as I don't look at it as I failed to get elected. I look at it as, you know, those were such great experiences for me. I learned so much. Uh, you know, in campaigning in this to two by-elections, I learned how to speak to people better, how to talk to my residents. I learned more about the issues. I attended the public council meetings to make sure I was comfortable in chambers. I understood the business of, of, of how a council meeting runs in chambers. Um, so I would encourage anybody who's thinking about it to do that. Attend your public council meetings. Your, your chamber is open to the public. Um, with COVID restrictions and things like that, obviously now you have to make an appointment, whereas before you could just, you know, come in and if there was room in the gallery, obviously you could sit down and, and, and watch, um, you know, the council meeting progress. But 
Um, and then, you know, reelected in the last two general elections. So this is 12 years for me now that I've been sitting around the council table. It's just been a wonderful experience. Um, I've, I've learned so much. I've met so many people. I've learned so much from other communities sitting on the Exploits Joint Council, participating in municipalities, Newfoundland Labrador events, working with the provincial government on uh, advocacy days through MNL. It's just such a vast opportunity of learning and just expanding, um, you know, how you work, how you work in, with the public, how you make your hometown your place. And we always talk about placemaking when it comes to municipal councils. And I think just being involved and being having a voice um, and lending that voice around the table and your shared experiences and your own individual experiences, it just helps shape your community. And that's why it's so important that we have such diverse voices around the council chambers and that boardroom table to move our communities forward. Absolutely agree. Thank you, Amy. Laura Bell, uh, we'll turn it over to you and just uh, get your opinions and your thoughts on uh, about the importance of diversity and inclusion and how that reflects uh, the goals of a, of a community and how people should be involved. I think and when it comes to running for municipal elections, especially in municipal, municipal, I think diversity is a really important aspect to ensuring a fair and democratic government. There are There is diversity that exists in every municipality within Newfoundland and Labrador. We're not just talking racial diversity, but we're also talking ableist and ableism diversity. We have gender diversity. We have, there's just so many aspects to diversity as a whole. So I think when we're talking about municipal elections and municipal government, in order to ensure that the government is a government of the people, by the people, and for the people, you need the people at the table. You need a government that is for you and by you, and it's not nothing without you. So for that, in people getting involved, it's important that you get a chance to kind of sit, if you're looking at running, to take that time to get involved in your council, to sit at those meetings. Yes, we have COVID going on, so yes, make those appointments, but you have a voice, and your 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 government does want to know what you think and what you feel. Your leaders aren't just making decisions willy-nilly. So to ensure that your voice is heard and the people you represent, whether people who look like you are going through the same experiences as you, have those voices at the table, it's important that you get involved because you can't fix issues if they're not known. So there are a lot of things that different communities are facing and different groups in those communities are facing that the leadership might not know is going on. So if you're not able to be at that table voicing those issues, nothing can be done to rectify them. So when it comes that when you are given that opportunity to either run for council or participate in council matters in any capacity, I would definitely say it's something that people should go for. It doesn't matter how young you are, there's always room for your voice to be heard. So to take that opportunity when it's offered. Thank you. And I, I echo those sentiments as well. As well. Uh, moving over to you. Uh, Mr. Mayor Tom Rose, uh, your perspective as well. Uh, I'm sure you have unique uh, things that you can add to the conversation and uh, add to the pitch as to why people should be involved, why it matters to be part of this conversation and part of municipal councils. Oh, you're, you're still on mute there, sir. Okay, here we go. Okay, thank you very much for that, uh, Madam Minister and Minister Parsons, uh, special guests and members of the media. Uh, for myself, uh, the big thing I say, it's rewarding um, when you get elected on council and you're a part of a team. And most of us on council in every part of this province, the goal is to make our communities better. And what does it take to do that? And some of the focus we have in Stephenville is uh, we're rich on diversity. We're rich on inclusion. We're rich on respect. We listen and we look at our community. What's it going to take to grow our town or to grow this province and grow this country? Because we, we look at it at all levels. And uh, first and foremost, somebody needs a job. But, but for ourselves, uh, when we approach council and our strategic planning and so forth, uh, that's only 50% of it. The other 50% is how respectful your community is how clean it is, how respectful we are to the environment, how friendly, how inclusive. So we've done a lot of work uh, working with all sectors from our Francophone societies and our culture on the Acadian side, from our LGBTQ 
uh, right on with our indigenous groups and in our community. And what we're finding is the diversity that exists in our touch points and all the collaboration and projects we're doing are showing significant dividends and benefits to the town of Stephenville. It's almost like today, when you look at Fortune 100, 500 type companies, the measure of their success sometimes is the people that they, they have within their network. And often now it's about a diverse uh, uh, employee base. And for myself, uh, I work very closely with my council, my deputy mayor, uh, uh, Susan Fallow, is very uh, supportive, very rich on the arts side. Uh, Councilor Laura Aylward is um, our kind of our Hazel McIsaac of Newfoundland. She's been on council for almost 30 years now, but she's a champion of healthcare. And that's such a big issue in our province. Uh, so for me, uh, I'm just very proud of uh, being part of a council. But the biggest thing I can say to anybody that's listening, uh, Minister Howell, is that the rewards are great when you look back at your achievements. And it's about being respectful and growing our communities. Thank you. And I agree with, with what you've added to the conversation as well. And, you know, it's uh, oftentimes it's you feel like it's um, sometimes it's hard work to, to make things happen. But when you come out the other side and you realize that you've contributed and you've made your community better and you can see that the results of your labor, it does make it worthwhile. So as part of our conversation today, we invited people to leave questions and comments about the municipal politics, about the upcoming elections, or anything really about municipal governance. Uh, we did receive some very insightful comments and, and the various issues that are happening right now, things that matter right now in our communities, like uh, climate change, good governance, accountability for councils, food security, supports for seniors and those with disabilities, as well as clean drinking water and, and the list goes on. So um, we'll work through some of the, the questions and uh, you'll excuse me if I'm referring to the notes because I don't want to miss any of the things that uh, were brought up. And um, you know, there are some questions that we received that were more specific to uh, my role in, in uh, municipal in the Department of Municipal and Provincial Affairs. Uh, we won't get to time to address those today, but I did make note of some of the questions that I saw, and I'll do my best to get information back to the people who had those questions. But for today, our primary focus is going to be around uh, the governance, uh, communities, and municipalities, and the elections. So uh, if you don't get the answer that you're looking for today on some of those questions, then by all means, reach out to me, and uh, we'll see what we can do to get information to you. So. Um, one question was, when it comes to governance, how do we ensure that those who are elected understand and abide by the legislation? So this is certainly important information for candidates and for voters. Um, we, we, we all accept that once we're in these positions, you know, you're, you're in a position where you have to be accountable for the decisions that you make for your community. Uh, and as my, from my perspective as the Minister of Municipal and Provincial Affairs, um, we're responsible for updating the legislation. So we've been working on the Municipalities Act in the department for a little while now and uh, hoping to see some solid movement in the fall as we get back into the House of Assembly, move forward with that piece of legislation. Uh, we've also discussed uh, the code of conduct that is required for councillors and uh, an understanding of how their roles and responsibilities impact their decision making, how they interact with counselors, with staff and with community members. So because that is such an important piece of what we do, we've decided to take that out into a separate piece of legislation. So we're going to be looking at the code of conduct as a, a, a very much a large factor in how we do municipal governance. Um, we've also included some things like mandatory training for counselors so that everybody understands where their roles and responsibilities are and, and some of the boundaries that may exist um, and some of the liabilities and responsibilities and accountabilities. So um, sometimes people come into this as I did, you know, you don't really know what you're signing up for. Uh, you know, you have a desire to see good things happen, but you don't really know how to accomplish it. So we want to make sure that the training is there so that counselors understand what is required and they have the ability to do this good governance. So we have a lot of positive things coming out of our department and um, we want to make sure that municipal leaders 
have the tools that they need to make good things happen on the on the ground level. Amy, I think that's true more than ever that um, council now that councils are reflecting a more inclusive approach and a wide range of perspectives and great opportunities. Uh, so, um, what do you think is how can we improve these this local governance? Well, I think ultimately the responsibility comes down to the individual to know your role on council, to know your responsibilities, uh, to understand that you are accountable for the things that you say, for the actions you know that you portray, um, and for the decisions that you are making around the table and, and moving out into your community. Uh, the code of conduct obviously is imperative that needs to you know that needs to be standard throughout all municipalities. Um, when we talk about you know legislative changes. Um, that allows the municipalities to move forward um, with better governance. Um, just understanding, uh, you know, when we have good governance in place, it allows us to make better decisions and to make them more easily. Um, so there's no gray areas. You're not wondering, can I do this? Um, you know, if I do it this way, does it meet the, you know, the legislative requirements? Different things like that. So. When we talk about the Make Your Mark campaign and encouraging members uh, from the communities to come forward, we want them to be informed um, as to what is available to them, like the new councillor training, um, you know, and, and just refer to the website, refer to the videos, talk to your fellow councillors within your community, and just basically be informed. Um, again, like I said, it's your responsibility at the end of the day, you're responsible for your words and your actions. Um, and what you do and say reflects on your community as a whole as well. Okay. So as a representative of council, um, you know, you always need to be aware of that. So we want to provide you with the tools to make sure that you're best informed. Right. Yep. Good points. Minister Persons, we all want to see more women serving on councils. In your role, what are you hearing from women who uh, want to be part or what do you think we can do to get more women involved? Well, first of all, I'd like to certainly commend that Equal Voice Newfoundland Labrador. Um, just recently, this organization organized a campaign college, and it went on for some time. There were a series of, of workshops, if you will. Um, we were virtual. They were virtual, of course, due to the uh, the pandemic. Uh, but I must say the the uptake was was really good, and uh, the discussion was very intelligent and, and insightful. Um, so I commend its groups like that, organizations, and and they're out there. Um, they're out there for you know to help women and gender diverse individuals to you know to come to the table and to share their experiences and even with regards because as we know I mean it's not simply just you know putting your name on a ballot um you know there's fundraising involved and I know that can be a deterrent for a lot of people I mean if we just look back um over the years traditionally the culture not just in our province and, and country but you know the United States I mean anywhere in the world uh, where we have democratic governance I mean you typically see the rich older men you know who run and, and who get in and who are successful, successful. Um, and that can be a deterrent to keep some really good quality candidates out of the mix but um due to the changes that we are making um with you know at provincial politics which of course set the tone for i would like to think municipal i know the federal government as well they come in with their you know their policy reviews every so often and you know it, it takes down those barriers to allow more good people to come forward um and, and keeping that conversation going um but we certainly do need more women involved and more gender diverse individuals because we we want to have a government at all levels that reflect the society that we live in. I think that's healthy. Um, and women certainly bring a different perspective to the table, uh, a different perspective. And I think it's healthy. And uh, and I'm, I'm happy to see that, you know, the new blood that's, that's been elected at our provincial table. But again, I'm really looking forward to seeing um, who's going to be, you know, how, how the municipal elections are, are going to turn out. I know, for example, uh, I have two um, very intelligent, capable uh, people in my department who are actually putting their names forward to run for, for municipal councils in St. John's and Mount Pearl. And, it, and it's very exciting to see. Um, but back to what we mentioned earlier about the uh, the code of conduct, uh, and, and I'm happy you brought it up, uh, Minister Howell, because as you know, and as you mentioned, we will be talking about this legislation now in the fall setting come October uh, to implement a code of conduct. It's very important for people to know uh, what, what is expected of them and, and, and you know what the rules are ultimately. And it's like you said, we jump in when I was certainly first elected as an MHA, 
you know, there was no sitting down training. Here's what you're supposed to do. Here's what you're not supposed to do. But since then, we've had some uh, we've had some new uh, policies put in place, of course, in particular harassment free policy, which is very important. Um, I think I'd like to see this adopted at municipal levels, because uh, as we know, I mean, people are in there. They're passionate about issues uh, people have their own way of doing things. But I think ultimately, when we know what's expected of us, it's much easier to perform, you know, in the most optimal, optimal way. And just a little something that I keep with me every time I speak in the House of Assembly, I always remember, first and foremost, I'm not speaking just as me as an individual. I am representing thousands of people who elected me to office. So and I and I and I always say that actually when I am speaking, no matter what the topic is, that, you know, this this government is certainly bigger than the 40 personalities around this chamber. We are representing the people of Newfoundland and Labrador. So I take that very seriously. And I'm very honored, you know, to do that, because believe you me, not everybody gets to do this. Not everybody gets to be elected to a municipal government or to a provincial government or certainly a federal government or territorial. I mean, you name it. So it certainly is a great honor and privilege. And the people put their trust and faith in you and their confidence. And so, uh, you know, I think if we we always remember that and do the best, honest, capable job that we can, I mean, I think we'll, you know, we'll certainly produce the best results. Thank you, Mr. Parsons. And uh, I think you're, you're bang on on some of those issues. Uh, Mayor Rose, I understand that you have some exciting things happening uh, to encourage more women to become involved. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we've been working very closely, I guess. When I look at all the groups in the community, uh, we work very closely with the Newfoundland Aboriginal Women's Network. And uh, they're a powerhouse in my town right now. They um, are champion. Um, a diverse, inclusive community. Um, my deputy mayor has worked very closely with me on that, along with all members of council. But we're in negotiations right now, and, and that's something I, I might have to reach out to you, uh, Minister Howell, on this. But we have the framework of a good relations treaty that we're looking at signing with our Indigenous groups in our town. And we have two groups. We have uh, the People of the Dawn, which is our friendship center kind of business incubator. And we work very closely with the Newfoundland Aboriginal Women's Network. So from a cultural Indigenous perspective, on that side of the inclusivity uh, paradigm, we're uh, working very closely with them. We actually turned over our business incubator, the W. E. Cormac Center, to the People of the Dawn. And we have seen some significant results but what we're feeling is that uh, the groups from our Women's Center to our People of the Dawn executive and their members is a confidence is building in the community. And I'm praying and hoping uh, at this municipal election, this platform is a, a, a way to promote uh, that we're going to get diversity running in our council. And I'd like for the first time ever, and we have two of my female councillors are running again in the election. So that's really good news. And um, I know of a couple of other females that are running in Stephenville. So I'm hoping for the first time that the balance shifts. It'll be the first time maybe ever that there'll be more females on the Stephenville Town Council since we were incorporated in 1952. That's, that's great news. Great stuff happening out in your neck of the woods and I uh, commend you and your council on how you move forward with these, these progressive uh, things to, to influence growth and development in your community. And uh, Laura Bell, that must be uh, encouraging for you to hear as well. A, a council that may be primarily composed of women and in, uh, in an area such as that with uh, such unique representation. What are your views on how we encourage greater diversity on councils and, and why is that important? I think when you're looking to encourage greater diversity in councils, I think it's important where people talk about the code of conduct, people need to know what they're getting into. There's a lot of hesitation for people who are minorities, whether it be gender, race, ethnically, or whether it's learning disabilities or physical disabilities. There's a lot of hidden ones when if you don't know what you're getting into, you're not willing to jump in. So when we talk about transparency and openness, is people have a better understanding of what's going on in the council chamber, what they can expect in terms of what meetings will be like, what the accessibilities around council meetings and council politics and just the entire community of being on council is like, it's a lot easier for people to break into that. When we look at increasing diversity, it's important that the people who are of minorities are, get a chance 
to dip their toe in before you fully jump in and run for council, that there are opportunities to work with your council, even within your community. So those are the creating those spaces where council and their diverse communities can come together and have an open conversation and kind of work on the issues that are existing in those communities are the best way to create a space where those communities feel and those populations feel like they can actually step and bring themselves to the table to be able to solve the other issues that might be going on. Because there's a lot of intersectionality when you look at diversity, just because someone is of a different race, that's not their entire identity. There's people who are of different races who are also, who are living with physical challenges, who people who are living with mental health challenges. So when you're looking at diversity, you wanna make sure that you're not just checking the box for saying, hey, we have this area of diversity taken care of, but to know that with diversity, you're also increasing intersectionality and there's a greater chance to fully serve your community in a deep and meaningful way. That's so important. And I, I like the point that you made. It's not about checking boxes. You know, you know, you don't want to stack up a lot of things that you've achieved. You want people to be part of it. You want to bring uh, as many different pieces to the to the puzzle as you can. And uh, as as unique as each of us are, we all have that many unique perspectives. So um, it's important that uh, that's included in our councils. Thank you. Uh, we had some more questions um, about issues like climate change, supports for seniors, food securities, drinking water, cost of living. These all came up in some of the comments that we received. And uh, in my own experience, um, these are all issues that municipalities can have a voice on and can contribute on. Um, some of these issues that, that I just mentioned are largely um, group work. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a team effort on a lot of these things. Um, municipal governments work closely with their provincial and their federal counterparts to ensure that services are delivered uh, at the ground level. And we, we often say that about municipal governments is, is there the boots on the ground when you look at a lot of these projects and a lot of these things that happen? And uh, it requires a lot of partnership with your provincial counterparts and the federal counterparts. So with the, the federal election on the horizon, it's an opportunity for municipal candidates and voters alike to raise these concerns uh, with those who are running federally and, and see what, uh, what the opportunity for teamwork and collaboration is there. And uh, again, uh, some of these issues seem to be big issues. And when you look at a, a small council or a local service district committee, um, when they try to tackle issues so large as, as water, wastewater management or uh, food insecurities, a lot of those things may seem like they're, they're too big to, to address. But um, this is where I'm going to sell you the pitch for our shared services models. Um, I think that uh, we've reached a point in our province where we have to start working together more closely with our neighbors, with our neighboring communities, with our uh, friends in our region and our district, and um, opportunities for regionalization, for municipalities to access better services, uh, to have more influence in your, your own sphere and in your own area. And um, I think that we're moving towards a time where we, we can no longer allow communities in Newfoundland and Labrador to exist in isolation. Um, they're, they're, the challenges are real and um, we're stronger when we work together. So by implementing these regional approaches and, and figuring out what works in certain areas, I think that's how we overcome some of these large these large challenges. And it'll certainly have a, a positive impact on how we do business in these communities and, and how residents, um, the experience of, of a resident in our town. So uh, moving forward, I think um, this is a conversation piece that's come out of our office for the last uh, number of years, uh, certainly the last few months since I've been hanging out in the, the municipal affairs department. Um, we're, we're going out and speaking to communities and trying to get a grasp on what it is you think uh, your region could look like. How can you share something with your neighbors? What are you doing? And truthfully, in a lot of the, the conversations, we realize that we're doing it anyway. A lot of these small communities are working with their neighbors. They're, they're piggybacking services. They've shared a, a, a project or whatever. And, and they're already doing this. We're just not calling it regionalization or shared services. So uh, it's my intent to get to as many communities as possible to hear about the good things that you're doing and how you're sharing and moving forward, uh, how we can look at your region. And um, I'm not coming out with a, a one size fits all plan because we know in Newfoundland that is certainly not the case. Um, 
where uh, and, and Newfoundland and Labrador, sorry, it's, it's the, the, the geography up there is even more challenging. And uh, we have to figure out what works specifically for our regions. So that's our intention is, uh, is to work with communities to figure out what it would look like in their backyards. Um, so Mayor Rose and uh, Amy Cody Davis, um, what do you see as the role of municipalities in, in addressing some of these big issues and delivering services to residents? We'll start with you, Mayor Rose. Yeah, okay, a great topic and I'm so pleased to speak on it. Um, when we got elected as a council in uh, four years ago, approximately, um, the first thing we did was um, through the advice of our economic development officer, we signed on with Partners of Climate Protection, a federal initiative uh, with goals setting towards 2050 on reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And we uh, diligently went after the milestones and we're doing very, very well right now. Uh, we have dedicated staff that are focused on uh, the applications and the processes. So what we do in Steve Mill now, one time, most municipalities, when they were making decisions, there was probably only two components that they looked at. One was, what's the economic impact and the benefit to the community? Your phone is dropping out here. And the other is, what's the social impact? So what we did in the town of Stephenville, we added a third element. So whenever we take on a project, we look at what's the economic benefit, the social benefit, well, what's the green benefit to this community? So it has to have a checkbox on the green for us to move forward. And by doing that, we have done so many different things. We've increased bike lanes, we've increased solar energy. We give grants to our community groups, uh, our SPCA, uh, we just put a $25,000 grant towards solar energy to mitigate their energy costs. So everything we're doing on that really works well. And we're very fortunate in Stephen Bowl. And when I hear the hardships on safe drinking water and uh, treating effluent and so forth, well, we had some good leadership back in 2005 when we put in a state-of-the-art uh, treatment facility to, uh, to treat our effluent. And now we accrue carbon credits on our effluent. Uh, plus, we were very fortunate, I guess, from a embrace by nature perspective, and that's our tagline in Stephenville, by the way, uh, that we have deep aquifers underneath our town with some of the best water in the country. It's very high alkaline. So uh, that's such a benefit to the town. We're, we're emissions free, we're clean, we're green, but the greatest thing I would uh, give the, for the advice of current councillors, new councillors, uh, government departments, is as a province, we are pristine, we are nature uh, bountiful, and anything that we can do uh, to promote innovation around green and reducing greenhouse gas emissions is critical to uh, the success and the growth of our province. You'll, you'll be the Minister of Environment's uh, spokesperson for, for that uh, type of project. I'm sure he'd be glad to hear you say those things this morning. How about you, uh, Amy? What do you think you could add? Anything you can add to that conversation on how we can uh, address some of these major issues together in, as municipalities? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think first and foremost, um, Council needs to work on and be familiar with your emergency preparedness plans, your town plans. Um, asset management is huge with municipalities, Newfoundland and Labrador, and we're working with our membership to make sure that they understand the importance of asset management, that they're tracking their infrastructure upgrades, um, know where their needs are when it comes time for replacement of certain types of infrastructure, that you're, um, you know, not using the same old, same old approach that you're looking at, um, you know, disaster mitigation, things like that. We put the proper infrastructure in place instead of just replacing uh, with the same of what was already there. So there's so many things that we can do there, um, you know, with regards to infrastructure upgrades um, within our communities. And also, you know, when we look at what COVID did to us, um, you know, the last year and a half um, and the effect that it had on seniors and the members in our communities, how we had to do things differently for uh, members of our communities, seniors who probably didn't have access to technology, weren't comfortable with uh, paying taxes online. You know, municipalities set up uh, safe and accessible drop boxes so they could drop their payments off 
um, at safe places instead of having to and not being able to access the town hall, um, being comfortable that those payments would be received and recorded properly. Uh, you know, working with our residents on uh, food security, um, staying in touch with our, our residents to see, you know, when there was a need, if there was a need to make sure that they were taken care of, that we got them, uh, you know, the, the food supplies and things like that, that they needed. There was different community groups set up who took care of all of that. So just being really in tune with the needs of your community um, and really just listening and working together, listening to the surrounding communities as well to see how they're doing things. Maybe they're, you know, you can partner on things. Uh, you can learn from how they're doing things. If it was the right way, if they struggled, then you know, let's try a different approach. So basically just always listening, always being aware. Um, you know, you're making sure you treat your town plans and your asset management plans, things like that as living documents, constantly referring to them, updating them, um, always front and center uh, you know, when you're working through your policies and your procedures to make sure that your your community is progressing. Very true. Great, great words, great advice. Um, I, and again, I would like to just take a minute to give uh, large credit to communities for how they've changed and adapted and, and to councils who uh, in the last year were met with unprecedented challenges, but did an awesome job of, of turning oftentimes on a dime uh, to change how they operate, how they did things, and to make sure that services were maintained in their community. So great work by, by the communities all across Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, one of the other questions that came was uh, regard, in regards to reconciliation. It said reconciliation must be at the forefront of all levels of government. So, and it's in everything we do. This is certainly an important issue for potential candidates and voters alike as we move into the, the next round of elections. Mayor Rose, as an Indigenous mayor, what work is happening and what can councils do to engage Indigenous peoples and organizations? You're still on mute there, my friend. Yeah, thank you very much for that question, Minister Howell. Uh, yeah, today at 5.30, uh, we're actually opening up uh, our Sweetgrass Festival, an event that takes place uh, here in Stephenville. It's second year running. Uh, we were approached by the people of the Don and the Newfoundland Aboriginal Women's Network, Halapu, uh, to get support. And that's part of the reconciliation. Initially at the town of Stephenville, uh, we uh, raised permanently the Mi'kmaq flag, which was the indigenous group that had the, the deepest presence here now. Uh, preceding that, obviously, was the Beothic. And, uh, and even preceding that, there's evidence on the Northern Peninsula with the uh, Innu and the Inuit uh, around port your area, minister that uh, has so much history around indigenous culture. But the big thing is... Um, we, we sit with them, we engage with them. Uh, we try to have soft touch points in our community. We have a new crosswalk in the community that's an indigenous crosswalk. Um, we, we have new entrance signs to Stephenville and an embedded subliminal advertising, I guess, we embedded our Indian head range, which was a part of Stephenville that was called Indian head. And prior to that, it was called Savage Cove in the early days by a, a colonialization by Cormac when he came through and so forth and seen the first indigenous people. So I, I think the biggest thing on reconciliation is that we have to talk about it. We have to sit down with indigenous groups. We have to embrace their culture and their indigenous background. And what I find is happening in my community, the more we do this, the more pride that's happening within all groups in the community. So we have uh, a large cultural base in Stephenville. We have uh, people from Africa. We have people from Iran, Iraq, uh, India, uh, the Philippines, um, from the Ukraine. So we have a lot of diversity and a couple of reasons for that. We have the college headquarters here. We have some significant programs with uh, the College of North Atlantic. And we also have a significant healthcare service here that attracts uh, students, professionals, doctors from all over the world. So what we did two years ago prior to COVID, we had our first cultural event that was hosted in Stephenville. And what it was, we invited every 
group that we could uh, reach out to. And we brought them to the event at the Arts and Culture Center. And what we did is we promoted our Newfoundland culture to them. And it was, you know, I, I could feel a little bit of anxiety in the room. First time they were brought in and recognized by the community for their diverse background. And it was a big thank you for us to basically say to them, thank you for, you know, choosing Steve Muller as a place to live and a place to work or a place to study. So our plan was go forward beyond COVID was now the next time we do our cultural events, they would then showcase their cultural background, whether it's food, dance, song, they would embrace us with their talents. So that's our forward plan, but I can't say enough about uh, being respectful, inclusive. Uh, we just got ranked as one of the 19 friendliest towns in Canada. And you know what, when, when I reflect, why did we get that? And you know, it's because we're inclusive and we're friendly and we're respectful. Absolutely. And congratulations to, to you and your community on that designation. It's certainly something to be proud of. Yeah. And uh, you, you've done a lot of great work and I um, want to reiterate that as uh, as we move forward with reconciliation, it certainly is a priority for our government. And uh, in my department in particular, we do have a, a couple of pieces that we're working on right now that uh, will ensure that we uphold those commitments. And uh, we want to work closely with uh, the groups that are responsible and to make sure that uh, our actions do reflect the importance of, of this type of work. So um, moving, we'll shift gears a little bit. So there, there are many things to think about when you consider a run for municipal politics. So women often have to think about childcare, they often have to worry about um, timing of meetings, how they're going to um, accommodate the, the, the work-life balance because for many councils this is a volunteer commitment it's not uh, not always a, a paid commitment so people have to fulfill their full-time work duties as well as the, the commitments to councils and uh, often may have a, a more of an uphill battle when we consider the traditional roles that they and weight that they carry in, in uh, child care and in families so um, how can councils move forward what can they do uh, to make this more welcoming and to offer new alternatives for people who have uh, other life commitments that they have to, to uphold. Um, so uh, in reading that question, I think I'll return to some of the conversations that I've had across the province in the last week, um, or sorry, in the last month when we were doing our little road show. <laughs> uh, we hit a couple of councils across the province where they had mentioned um, women were interested in running, but uh, they knew the scheduled meeting times would not be, they wouldn't be able to accommodate that in their schedule. So one council in particular uh, brought in a babysitter. They had a, a, a teenager uh, who was a, a daughter, son or daughter uh, of a council member who uh, volunteered their time during the council meeting to hang out in the, in the council building with the children of uh, the councillors who wanted to bring their kids and, and have them minded. And I thought that that was a great solution to what is oftentimes a, a bit of a, a deterrent is what, what, you know, what I'm gonna do with these kids while I'm gone to the meeting. So by making that resource available, they eliminated that challenge. So I thought that was very forward thinking and something very uh, innovative, something simple, uh, but innovative into opening up uh, opportunities for people running for councils. Uh, Amy, do you have any uh, anything that you'd like to add to that? How, how councils can move forward, municipalities can make things more accessible to people running? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think, you know, we, we absolutely need to be more accommodating to the needs of, uh, you know, the residents in our community who are interested in running for council. That babysitter, I mean, that's just fantastic. I have three children. My youngest was 10 months old when I was first elected to council. I was lucky I had a lot of family support who could help me with childcare. If that, if I didn't have that, I, you know, probably wouldn't be sitting here on this panel today having the conversation about, you know, how do we make things more accessible for women and, and encourage them to run for council. Um, being on council, you know, it's important work. It takes time and it takes concentration. 
And the more that we can accommodate, then the more women will be able to um, generate an interest with in, in serving because their, their opinions, um, you know, their life experiences, everything that they can come, uh, that they bring to the table is very important in moving our communities forward. And, uh, you know, we certainly, we just have to do better at that. Um, when we talk about the Make Your Mark campaign, again, it's about encouraging people, um, you know, finding the information, asking the questions, being aware of what's available to you. Um, you know, we need to do a better job of, of finding funding available to maybe provide daycare services for women uh, to attend council meetings. Again, just to bring it back to COVID, I mean, as, as horrible as COVID was to everybody, it really made us refocus. And we do meetings now on Zoom, like like this event here today, which normally would have been an in-person event um, and probably would have had difficulty bringing everybody together. We're now all here together on screen having these important conversations. We know now that meetings can be held virtually. So that does open up other opportunities. Maybe if you're not able to get out of your house because of childcare barriers, um, you can participate in your meeting via Zoom or via Teams or, you know, however you want to be able to do that virtually conference call, however. So I think if we make, uh, you know, make women aware and, and everybody aware that these possibilities now exist and that councils are more flexible, we're more accommodating, that'll certainly bring more people forward and we'll, we'll you know, we'll gain that diversity that we're so lacking in our councils currently um, and will help us progress and move everything forward to be more accessible and to be more diverse. Completely agree. Minister Parsons, is there anything in conversation? Um, absolutely. I think it's about being creative and taking those uh, new initiatives. And I certainly commend those councils who, you know, who had that wonderful idea, uh, you know, to bring young people in, our youth in to help uh, with the child care. I mean, I think it's a win-win. I think that, uh, you know, that, that young that young person who was able to, you know, provide the babysitting services and the child care, that's an experience for them. Um, as well, of course, it allows moms to get in those council chambers and to bring those very important perspectives and very important issues to the table. Um, I also want to talk about the legislation that we recently brought in and introduced in the House of Assembly, where we allow babies on the floor of the House of Assembly. Mm -hmm. um, now, you know, and so, so so technically there are 40 seats in the House of Assembly, 40 members, but sometimes we have 41. We have Minister Sudley, who, who sometimes uh, brings in baby Alexander. So he's made his appearance in, in the council, uh, well, in the rather the provincial chamber. Um, so it's, it's, it's these sorts of initiatives, and it's all about support. And it comes from family support. As we know, um, women are the primary caregivers to the household. I mean, I can use my own example as my my mom, for example, my mom, uh, when my sister and I were, were young, when we were born, uh, you know, she she stayed home with us full time. Uh, when we were old enough, uh, you know, in, in our school age, but junior high school and whatnot, my mother actually went and, uh, you know, went to school again, got a course and, and went to the back to the workforce. My grandmother uh, raised 13 children. She was the stay home, uh, stay home mom, of course, in, in that family. Uh, and we know women will always probably ultimately be the primary caregivers. Now, not to say there are a lot of good men out there who support good dads and husbands as well but ultimately we, we know traditionally that you know this probably won't change but we need to come up with creative ways and supports and initiatives that we can also get those moms and, and in, you know into the into the chambers and, and at these you know in, at these tables where it's very important where we near, need to hear these perspectives so again it's it's about being creative bringing new supports as well minister howell if i if i could just add one little thing there i think um, covid you know, with COVID, there's been some negative things, but there's some positive things and was mentioned Absolutely. earlier, Amy mentioned, right? But uh, one of the things we're doing, like we have some young family members working at the town of Stephenville. So from an HR perspective, what we're looking at is trying to get uh, our staff now to do their compressed hours, whether it's 35, 37 and a half hours. And we, I want to get down to four day work weeks. Uh, mm -hmm. I'd like for every business that can do it in this province, I'd like for the government to consider looking at promotion of four day work weeks, because what it does, it actually helps with reducing mental health. It helps with anxiety, all of the issues. Uh, it benefits family units, young families. And then now we have such small family units that sometimes there may only be one or two siblings right. uh, that exist to help with parents and grandparents. And then the other side of the equation is it's very healthy for your economy from tourism and business because when people have more time off 
and whether they're going to work you Monday, spend more money. Thursday. Exactly. <laughs> and uh, the evidence That's in true. some of the European countries, it's part of their legislation. That's and right. it's being very proactive. And uh, I'm going to, I'm going to the put you yeah, there and let okay. you know that that is to kind of come up for us. And uh, it's not a foreign concept. It's certainly something that uh, we, we've chatted about. And uh, moving forward, we do look forward to those types of discussions. But I'm just getting a, a note here now that we're, we're running out of time. And I did want to swing one last question to Laura Bell. Um, in the, the conversations that we've had here, you know, we all talk about inclusion. We all talk about diversity. And we're all interested in making that happen. But in your perspective, um, how do you think uh, somebody who looks at a, a local government and sees themselves reflected in that government, how do you think that impacts their lives and, and how they function and their view in their community, how they're accepted and, and how their life is improved when they see that element reflected in their councils? So representation is something that affects everyone. You are more comfortable when you feel like you're represented by your leaders. You feel like you are actually welcome and you are a legitimate part of a community when you see representation in your leadership. I think when we're talking about effective governance and seeing representation, if you feel like you're represented in your government, you feel like there's a safe place to actually voice your issues. If you do not see representation, whether it be race, gender, sexuality, or physical ability, you do not think they are adequately aware of the issues that are being faced within your community. So one of the things that I was really important to me when we're talking about things like that is we have the pedestrian mall in St. John's, Newfoundland. So one, there was an article written last year when the pedestrian mall originally launched during the pandemic, um, recording the issues about accessibility within the pedestrian mall. That yes, it's a wonderful addition to have this thing that makes us, that gives us the ability to still congregate and meet with people and have a sense of freedom during a pandemic, but it's not an accessible place downtown and things like that so when leadership was making this official this creating the space where yes this is a wonderful thing they didn't think about accessibility because there weren't people who were sitting on council making those decisions that had that issue so representation and effective governance go hand in hand because if you aren't adequately represented at the table the issues that fault and affect you in your daily life are not at the table so they aren't being weighed on they aren't being discussed and that way they aren't being fixed so we do need representation in every aspect of our governance, whether it be provincial, municipal, or federal. But it is, is very important, especially municipally, because the decisions municipal council make affect the daily lives of their citizens. So if you are given the opportunity to run, run, not just Absolutely. for you, but for the people that will come after you for years and years to come. And for council, when you're sitting and making those decisions and you have issues, Go back to your communities, not just the communities that you see that represent yourself, but the ones that you're not seeing at the table. It is important that you bring the issues that are being brought to the council chambers to those communities that aren't currently at a seat because they have opinions, they have voices, they have, there's a level of intersectionality that's being missed when they're not at the table and they're not being represented. And that way the decisions and the solutions that are brought to the table might not be as accommodating, as inclusive as is the thought if you do not have adequate representation at that table. Certainly important to, to have that included in, in the solution to many of these problems. So uh, thank you, thank you for that. And uh, I just wanted to, I see our time is, is slipping by here. So I wanted to clue up quickly and just thank everybody for their participation today. I think we could probably, you picked a good bunch because we could probably talk about this all day long, right? But uh, Thank you so much to Minister Parsons, to Amy, to Tom, and to Laura Bell for joining us today. Um, I just wanted to let anybody who's watching know who may have questions. I'm sure anybody on this panel uh, would be willing to take a question uh, if you have something that wasn't answered, if you're looking for resources, uh, if you want an encouraging word or a should I, should I not um, kind of conversation, these people will lead you in the right direction. Uh, the Department of Municipal and Provincial Affairs is also there with a, uh, a lot of resources, training, and things that we would like to uh, get into communities. So by all means, reach out to us. And I know that MNL has done a great job with a lot of their resources around the upcoming election. So they have a bunch of stuff that you can get from them. If you have questions, uh, reach out to them as well. And uh, again, I think that's that's the, the bulk of what we've done here today is to remind people that your, your 
community councils matter and your voice matters and uh, we want you to be represented we want you to be heard and this is your opportunity um, you know a lot of people look at their communities and they see things that they aren't happy about and uh, I always like to say instead of throwing rocks at the building why don't you put your name on the ballot and then get a seat at the board table so that's how you make change and that's how you influence decisions in your your community so uh, please by all means reach out to us if you have questions and thanks again to uh, everybody on the call today for your time and for your contributions. Minister Hal, if I could just uh, no, a quick little blurb before we uh, before we sign off, I'll be quick. I think it's important, and I certainly want to extend this uh, encouragement to all municipal governments. Um, here in Newfoundland, Labrador, in our government, of course, Premier Fury has implemented mandatory GPA plus, so the gender-based analysis lens to be applied to every policy, every program, everything that's produced from government of Newfoundland, Labrador. I know this is an initiative as well that the federal government has taken on, so it's something I certainly encourage all municipal governments to do to you know to implement that GPA plus lens to everything that's produced every program every policy and that said one last thing uh, we are we'll be holding a very great event a special event called daughters of the vote uh, it's going to be led by the department of women gender equality of course uh, my team um, and that gives young women and gender diverse individuals an opportunity to come in sit in the legislature and experience a day in the life say as an mha and to act as an mha and to get those experiences in our chamber that's coming in november so please look for those invites on that sure We'll get some more information on that if you hear that. So I gotta gotta wrap us up and I'll hand it back to you, Lynn. Thanks again, everybody. Thank you, Minister. We'll now invite uh, the media with questions for the participants. Uh, the first question is uh, based on order of registration uh, and it will be from Glenn Whitman of the Telegraph. Go ahead, Glenn. Hi, uh, anybody can answer this. I just want to just uh, give me a, a brief overview of, of what is the most important thing for encouraging diversity on councils that's coming up this election and how is it important so important in our time right now this day and age um i can speak to that yep go ahead Laura. Yep. so accessibility so when you want to encourage diversity on councils you need to make council accessible you need to make getting involved in council accessible whether that be through there is a lot of language language accessibility issues when it comes to council. Yes, English is the first language within Newfoundland Labrador, but a lot of the people who live in within Newfoundland Labrador might not have English as their first language. So making sure that council documentation is accessible so people are able to understand what's being done within their municipalities, and then they can then take the steps to be actively in actively um, connected with their council. So when you're dealing with accessibility is the first step. For council to be more diverse, it needs to be incredibly accessible to all members of their community. Very much. And I'd, I'd like to add to that as well, because in my respectful council, a respectful atmosphere where everybody um, can have their say and feel like they're contributing, uh, that everybody is credited with their, their own uh, experiences and their own backgrounds and valued for what they bring to the table. So I think that was largely important for me. Thank you. Our next question is from Kellyanne Roberts of uh, NTV. Go ahead, Kellyanne. Uh, thank you. A lot of conversations here and discussions around diversity and bringing more people uh, to the table. Uh, with the nominations due very shortly here for the municipal election, what's the biggest thing that people need to know about if they're looking to run? Amy, do you want to have a little uh, a swing at that one from Eminem, or I can take it? Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, well, I'll just give another plug to the Make Your Mark campaign. Um, you know, that that uh, initiative with uh, MNL and with the Department of Municipal and Provincial Affairs is designed to uh, aid anybody who's interested in running for council, answer any questions that they may have about time commitments, um, you know, what their requirements are, what's expected of them once they're elected, how to run campaigns. All that information is available through the Make Your Mark campaign. We would encourage anybody to read reach out to us on the social media channels for Make Your Mark NL, uh, reach out to municipalities, Newfoundland and Labrador, and reach out to PMA and your, um, your town halls, your town offices, because that's where all of that information would be available. Um, you know, that your town offices, uh, your town clerks, all the staff there um, have all that information at the ready. They know all the deadlines. They know what information is required of you um, and they can give you a good idea as to what your involvement 
involvement would be once you are elected to council. So certainly uh, reach out on the social media, contact your town offices, reach out to myself or m &L at any time. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Nope, okay, well, that concludes our time for the media availability and our live broadcast this morning. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. Have a great day. Thanks so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody.